Hey guys, welcome to System Design Fight Club. Tonight we're going to be covering uh, the design for a distributed job scheduler. Um, here are some resources that I found helpful for trying to figure out how to do this. There's a really nice discussion on Leak Code actually in their um, uh, their discussion section. Um, so there's there's the problem section of Leak Code, and then there's actually the discussion section. They actually have some really nice system design coverage in there. Uh, Dropbox had a really nice post on this. Um, I was, I, I think it could have gone a little bit more in depth on um, the diagram itself and some of the interactions on it, but in terms of um, tech blog posts for um, tech companies, um, it was, it's, it's pretty solid. It, it definitely meets the bar for what most engineering uh, companies put out for their uh, blogs. Um, There's another nice one on towards data science that I liked a lot, and then somebody also did a, a LinkedIn post. Um, that looked a little bit like what people post on uh, Leak Code in the discussion sections for system design. Uh, Jordan actually covered this problem as well. Um, I think there are some other YouTube channels that also covered it. I didn't actually really try to go through them as much. I like to skim the blog posts a lot more than YouTube videos. Um, and then um, Grok can actually cover this problem as well in their thing for, um, it was uh, system design for engineers and managers. Um, I haven't tried to get access to a copy of that, but it definitely did have it somewhere in there in Grokking. And I know uh, it at least used to have a really solid reputation for um, system design content. Um, so uh, we can go ahead and jump into the problem now. Uh, the requirements that we will have is that users can submit jobs to be run. Uh, users can view the status of the job that they have scheduled and users can view the output of the job that they have run. Um, so we're going to have uh, 1 billion jobs submitted per day. I got this number based off of the, uh, the, the one. I actually based my numbers off of the Dropbox post. Um, they actually seemed like they were getting roughly this amount of traffic. Uh, we're going to let the jobs take about five minutes to run. Um, there was a pretty nice range of um, different values that you could have for it. But um, I think five minutes seemed like a pretty fair number. Um, I actually have run uh, code on a supercomputer before. Back when I was in college, I took a class on supercomputing, and um, it was just like a thing to use um, CUDA or P threads or something. And it was it was actually very similar to what I've seen on a lot of these blog posts. Is that I I wrote this little um, script in like C or something, and I, um, I, I I like uploaded it somewhere, and then I I clicked like uh, let's schedule it for up to five minutes for running. And then it, uh, and then I said, go run it. And then it told me like it get it scheduled in like 30 seconds or so. And then I was able to look at the output like um, after it was done running. Um, yeah. So it, and most of the time, my the, it was um, the homework assignments were were set up so that it would take um, no more than five minutes for those. Um, I imagine that people that are really trying to use um, supercomputers for legitimate work might have them for a little bit longer. I'd imagine a corporate setting, though, if you're just using a job schedule, it's it's like alternatively you'd be using MapReduce. So I, I think five minutes is pretty fair for what you would actually have in a, a job runner. Um, OK, we can go ahead and do some estimates now. Um, are there any questions before we jump into that? Any questions about the requirements or anything like that? OK, uh, I'll go ahead and jump in then. So. Um, how many uh, jobs per second are going to be scheduled? Um, uh, how many machines do we need for running them? And then, um, oh, OK, I didn't really jump into uh, how the storage would look. So we'll say um, input file and output file are um, five megabytes um, and uh, the uh, data retention for one day. Retention for one day. Okay, how many machines do we need running them? How much storage do we need? Um, I think that's all the important numbers. So how many jobs per second? So we have 1 billion jobs divided by, we have 100,000 seconds in a day. Um, so that is 1,000 uh, million divided by 100,000. So that is 1 uh, million divided by 100, um, 1,000 K divided by 100. 
that is 110, 10,000. So 10,000 per second. That's our answer. Uh, how many machines do we need for running them? So uh, we're getting 10K jobs per second. Um, jobs take five minutes to run, which is um, 300 seconds. So that means that uh, you will have, I think, 300 times 10K machines running at a time. We'll say that each job occupies one thread. That's why I have these numbers here. Um, so it'll come out to um, 30 uh, threads are runnable per machine, and each job can just be run on uh, one thread. It just occupies one thread while it's running. Um, so 300 times 10K, uh, 100,000, 1 million, so that is uh, 3 million tasks running at a time. And then um, we have uh, 30 threads available per machine. I'm rounding 32 down to 30. And um, so we're going to do 3 million divided by 30. Um, so that is 3,000 by 30. So divided by 10. So we had 300K divided by uh, Three, so it's um, 100,000. You need uh, 100,000 machines. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, it lines up with a lot of what I saw in the other problems. Um, so I'm used to in, in these other problems, I, I have, um, it's like, oh, this, this is uh, YouTube. I'd imagine this is gonna need like 5,000 machines. And then somehow it only comes out to like two or three. Uh, and then for this, when I was estimating, uh, when, I was, when I was thinking about it, I was like, I, I, I bet I can do this with like, you know, three or five machines. And then it's like, nope, for the scale that we want to handle um, 100,000 machines. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's, that lines up with what I've seen in the uh, other posts. We actually have a um, really big scale for once. <laughs> um, okay, so how much storage do we need? Uh, we have 1 billion jobs uh, per day. And we're going to retain for one whole day. And uh, input and output files are five megabytes each. So input plus output file gets us 10 megabytes. So we're going to have 1 billion uh, times 10 megabytes. Uh, 10 billion uh, megabytes is how much storage we need. Uh, that is equal to 10 million uh, gigabytes, 10,000 terabytes. Oh, geez. Okay. 10 of um, petabytes. That's a pretty fair amount of storage. That is uh, definitely a pretty fair amount of storage, too. Uh, all right. I did not actually crunch that in advance. That's a little surprising. So uh, you're going to want S3 or something like that. Um, okay. Uh, why is it three, two threads per core? Um, so that's just something that I got off of different. So I actually think I got these two numbers off of uh, this blog post. Um, and so usually with um, cores, you can do hyper threading or something like that, where you're able to run two threads at a time off of a single core. Um, I guess I guess it's up to you for whether or not you, you agree with hyper-threading being a, so if, if you're running a super uh, computationally expensive task, I'd imagine that it would have a lot more occupation of that core. And I, I don't know how well hyper-threading works if you're actually like heavily using that core and like properly using it for like a computationally expensive task. But um, that that post at least said two threads per core. And I'd imagine it's off of, um, it's, it's this one. I'd imagine it's off of um, hyper-threading or something like that. Um, any other questions before we move on to the diagram? Very cool. Um, one other side note that I wanted to make before I move on is that hyperthreading was also a thing that was, um, I think it was the security vulnerability in Spectre. Um, so I think 
uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda functions in particular are probably really susceptible to Spectre. And I'd imagine they probably actually turned that off for a while. Um, because it was uh, that, that's uh, from a side channel attack where if you have one thread you're occupying, you can kind of spy on the other threads running on the CPU through the, the Spectre vulnerability, which uses um, side channel um, attacks. Um, I uh, hope, hopefully you're, you're actually able to do hyper threading that doesn't actually work anymore. Uh, just a fun side note though, is that, um, yeah, I, I don't know how, how uh, secure hyper threading was for a little while. Okay, we can go ahead and hop into uh, the diagram. Um, so we're going to have uh, a user. This will be the um, browser for um, users submitting um, jobs. Uh, or it could even be uh, it could even be a terminal. And they'll just use SSH or something or, or um, FTP. I think I actually submitted my files when I ran stuff on a supercomputer through um, FTP. I did a FTP upload and then I told it about the file or something. Um, you're going to want to, do I have, oh, no, I do not have um, the uh, database shape. That's okay. Uh, well, so we're gonna have an input object store. Um, you will have an output object store. You will need to have the workers themselves. There, oh yeah, that's right. I don't have um, three boxes on this. Uh, so we're gonna have um, the workers, which is where we have, um, we're gonna have like 100,000 workers apparently. Uh, to have these, um, you are going to need a couple of data stores. There's going to be um, the task data store. So it's like on submitting it, you will, uh, it'll, it'll be like pending or something for a while. So you're going to need to store the, um, you'll have the object for the task, the, the, the object file of the, um, so I submitted a, a C file and then it was compiled on the worker before it ran the job. Um, but then you would track that, hey, it's going to need to get, so you you'd stick the C file onto this and then you would track that, hey, there's something that needs executed on um, this thing. We're actually going to have a machine um, metadata store. Machine, um, it'll just store uh, data about machines. Um, we're probably going to want to do heartbeats or something. So this can even store the heartbeats. It'll track whether or not a machine is available or whether it's running a task. It'll uh, track what task is assigned to a specific machine. This one will have the status of the tasks. Um, let's make a little more space. Uh, this is going to take a lot of room. Okay, so we have the data store, but you can't interact with that directly through the browser. So we're going to need to have a task uh, receiving service. It's, it's some kind of um, task um, capture service. That's what we'll call it. Um, we also will need to have, uh, so we can have a task status service, a task status viewing service. Um, I'm probably going to merge it at the end, um, but right now, um, traditionally in system design interviews, you kind of have like each API route is almost like its own service, but um, we're probably going to merge these two at the end. Um, task, status, uh, viewing service, so that one is going to be reading. I'm going to be using um, data flow arrows. This is not actually the direction that the request goes. So you're going to send data to the task capture service. It's going to capture some information over there. And then um, you're also, so you will have a pre-send URL. This is going to be something like S3. And so you're actually going to talk, you're going to send the file directly to S3 over a pre-signed um, URL. And then, uh, so we have the task data service. It is going to read off of the task data store. So I'm going to have it going that way, even though it's this that's calling this, it's making a request over to the data store, but uh, the data flows from the data store to here, it's reading off the data. So this is writing, this one is reading. So that's why the data, uh, even though they're both making requests, that's why the arrows are going that way. And then um, the user can request the status of their task. 
So it's actually going to go like that is how we're going to do it. Um, and then when they, so that's when they're viewing the tasks. So I actually want to move this a little bit. So I'm going to do browser for when they are viewing the job status, job status. I see that we have a question in the chat. Uh, shouldn't the machine data store the zookeeper cluster? Um, basically for machine discovery and their heartbeat. So I've seen some people using Zookeeper before for this. So somebody, there's at least one person that used Zookeeper for um, service discovery. I'm not personally familiar with how service discovery works or that, that spe specific role that you can use Zookeeper for. I'm more familiar with Zookeeper as a distributed locking service. Um, so that is, I, 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 I'm, I've definitely seen some people use Zookeeper in a service discovery role. I'm just not personally familiar with it as much. Um, but yeah, that's, that's definitely an approach that some people take. Um, and uh, so we're going to have heartbeats off the workers. And so that is going to be these talking directly to that data store. Um, okay. And then um, so we have the machine data store. Uh, and the task data store, we're going to have a scheduler. That's right. We want to have an actual thing that's going to schedule stuff to the workers. So this is going to be the scheduler. And so that, so you can either have the workers, you can either push the task to the workers or you can have the workers pull a task off of something. So when the worker's done, it can try and pull something off the scheduler. Um, so the issue here is that so the scheduler is either going to have, you're, you're either going to have more tasks than machines, or you can have more machines than tasks. And so um, if you have, if you don't have enough tasks, then you're going to have a bunch of machines that are sitting idle. And so then are they just going to be continuously pulling the scheduler? If you have a um, hundred thousand machines and half of them are um, not being used, then you'd have uh, 50,000 machines that are pinging the scheduler every minute or something like that. Um, so I, I don't want to have it as a pool because then you would have these doing polling of the scheduler or something like that. So I'd rather have it as a push. It's so going to have the scheduler push the data to the workers is the approach that I wanted to take. And then um, so you can either have more machines than tasks or more tasks than machines. Um, what I wanted to have is that the scheduler would read the data off of tasks and the machines every so often. It's, it's going to read both of these two. So you're at least going to need some data flow from this data store to the scheduler and from the machine data store to here. And that is the scheduler doing a read of these two data stores. And then, um, okay, so then how are, you can either have this doing polling of this data and then when it sees that there's a machine that becomes available, it'll then send a task over there. So that would be polling. Or if you have um, more um, machines than tasks, it was, um, you can either do a direct call from here to the scheduler. So you can have an API call here, uh, or you can have a message broker and it just pulls data off of it or you can have this thing just reading directly from the da task data store. This was like the most confusing aspect of this for me. It was like, how are we gonna have the scheduler um, figure out when it wants to, like, how is that whole interaction there gonna work? Cause there's like three different options. Um, so instead I'm gonna leave that open for now and I'm just gonna have an arrow going into it, but there's like multiple options here. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, okay, so we have the task, we captured it in there. Um, we have the task ID there. It's, it's storing the metadata about the task. Actually, we should call that task metadata store because it's not storing the script itself. It is storing, um, it's just tracking it uh, and the, the like status of it. Um, the, the whole file for the, the C file or whatever goes directly over there. Okay, so we talk to this, we're like, hey, we want a job uh, to run and we're gonna have the metadata there. And this thing is also, so this thing's probably gonna talk to this. No, that's the data store. This thing is going to set up a spot for the file to go into the S3 bucket. 
and then it'll hand the URL back and then this thing uploads directly to the input object store. Okay, and then at some point the schedule is going to pick up on the task and it's going to see that there is a machine that is free and it'll schedule it to the worker. And then the worker's running and it's going to send heartbeats over to, can I say, oh, I can't just go ahead and, so it'll send heartbeats over to the data store. Um, and then uh, when it's done running that, oh, I need a data flow arrow from there to here because um, the worker is going to pull the data directly off the S3 bucket. Um, and then when it's done, it's going to put the output file to the output object store. And then it will also want to update its status in the machine data store. It will mark itself as available. So that will be, we'll say that we'll have mark um, self as available. Okay. And then um, we have that mark self is available. Um, we also need to have the task marked as complete. So it's also going to want to do that, but I don't want, so this, this thing's doing like a lot of stuff on the task completion side. Um, so we're gonna talk about how we can kind of um, reduce the number of arrows coming out here, is that we are also going to want to have this thing somehow updating this. And um, so I, I, a complaint that I've had in the past is that, um, Something that's unrealistic about most system design interviews is that you'll have a bunch of services that are tightly coupled through a data store directly. And that is um, a little bit wacky. And uh, so the workers in particular would look wacky here because they're talking directly to at least, this, this is already talking to three different data stores. It would be a fourth right here if it did talk directly to that. So instead I wanna just have a broker. So it, on, on top of that, since it's talking to at least three different data stores. Um, well, so four, if I include, okay, so one, two, three, four different data stores. What if a single one has some kind of outage? What if um, this database is down or this one? So you can kind of reduce that a bit by using a broker. So I wanna decouple that. Um, so you can even do, uh, so you, you can't get rid of, you, you can't put this on the other side of the broker because it's a whole file. You do have to talk directly to that object store. You do need to, um, directly put the file onto the output object store. You can't you can't move a gigantic file over this. I think if you're using Kafka here, there's even I think a one megabyte limit to the size for the messages, and so you can't even fit the whole file onto Kafka. I believe. Um, not uh, I, so we're we're doing ten thousand tasks per second. I think so. You would you would want to use Kafka at that scale. I think you you would probably want to use Kafka at that scale. So you would actually use Kafka here. And so that would be a physical limitation uh, is that additionally, you would just straight up not be able to put the output uh, files if they're five megabytes onto this. So we can't move that. You can go ahead and move this arrow onto the other side, but it is already talking directly to the machine data store for the heartbeats. Um, we might've been able to do something like send the heartbeats over a, a queue or something, but I feel like that's unnecessary complexity. Um, what I was kind of going for is that if we're going to make it look a little bit more like a realistic sim design instead of just a, a, you know, interview design is that you would kind of start to split these off into, um, you would kind of, um, look at how it would work on um, a bunch of teams is that you would maybe have task team that has their data store and their task CRUD service, that's, that's what this would be, is that you're gonna just merge these to form a CRUD service wrapping around the task metadata store. And then you'd have um, the workers or the, the execution team that handles, um, so this thing just tracks the task that needs to get done. It just takes the task in, it stores it. Um, it doesn't care about when it gets done, it just tracks that, hey, there's this task, it needs to, it needs to happen. Well, this is the this this area is about making the task actually happen. It doesn't care about um, making it reliable. It's not as oriented around um, um, the uh, this is oriented around availability towards the end user. This part is not so much oriented around the availability for the end user. It's more uh, it, it's almost like a control plane data plane setup 
um, if we're going to split it like that. Um, but that was like my thinking is that we would just have a CRUD service for this data store, and then we have another data store for a different team. And then it would look a little bit more realistic. Um, and then uh, it, it, this would resemble a, a real uh, system, I think, if you had a you could use a broker here. And so then this team would not be interacting directly with the data store over there. You don't want to have multiple teams that are sharing a database. That's, that's what I was kind of getting at is that you don't really want to share a database across a team. And so then um, the only thing uh, in this current setup where you'd have a database shared between two teams is um, this interaction right here, which you can also bring through the uh, CRUD service as well, is that you can go ahead and have, um, you would have another thing for uh, task metadata reading. So you'd have task, uh, info, it'd be a task info endpoint. And so then you would just go through the task info endpoint. And then all three of these boxes over here can just be brought into a single service. It's just a CRUD service. And then you would not have uh, this talking directly to the data store. It'd just be um, doing a read off of this task service. And uh, so then you don't have any data store that is shared between multiple teams, which would be, um, that's uh, a very bad practice. Um, so uh, to keep the workers from talking to the data store, you would then use a broker over here. So that's why that broker's there. Okay, so we have the broker and then you're gonna need to have, um, these three can be merged um, like that but you have this, and then you're gonna need some, uh, it, like an AWS Lambda function or something that will take the messages off of the broker. You can't have a broker talk directly to your data store itself. Brokers are themselves a type of data store. That was in DDIA, as you can think of brokers like a data store, um, but you would need something that would pull off of it and then write it into the data store. And then um, you would just have that, um, so I'm right here drawing that uh, this thing is pulling off of the broker and then it writes it over to there. And so this would be owned by the task team. So we're gonna have this, have it dashed like that. So I'm kind of showing the, the team boundaries here is that we have this like tasks team that owns a task data store. And then we have this one that's oriented around the um, execution of the tasks. I see there's a comment in the chat. There may be some value in having the task capture devices and task data service separate. I think the task data service may be called more frequently. Okay, so that is that is a point of microservices is that um, so there's service oriented architecture and then there's microservices. Um, service oriented architecture is just where you don't have one big monolithic service um, which is just at, at, at Amazon out of ne necessity, you would not want to share one code base to 10,000 engineers or anything like that. I heard the value add from microservices that can scale these independently. And so that is actually a great comment because if this is getting called more than the task capture service, then you would want to scale this one independently of this other service. And so then um, keeping these separate would actually make a lot of sense there. Uh, I mean, task capture service instead of task capture device. Am I doing this right? You mean, so you mean this and this should be kept separately, right? All right, go ahead. And I, I think that's what you meant is that these two should be separately since they need, uh, since they can now be scaled separately. Uh, go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong on that, on, on my interpretation there though. Um, so, um, I have these three things. They could be merged into one gigantic uh, CRUD service. Uh, okay, awesome. That is what you meant. Thank you. Cool. Okay, so I have these three little microservices that talk. Uh, so e even even with how I have the setup where we have um, three uh, different services that are all interacting with this, this is still better than allowing the scheduler to interact directly with the data store. Um, just because if we had it talking directly to the data source, that then you have a database shared by two different teams and that's just bad practice. And so even though um, just having this talk through an intermediary here, it's just kind of like some glue code is, is basically, basically what that service is. It still is better just because it decouples these two teams from having to share a data store. 
Um, so I still think it's a pretty great idea to do this. Um, and then we have the task runner that just writes the stuff off of there into the task metadata store. Um, yeah, okay. And then we have the scheduler. How are we gonna talk to the scheduler? Um, we could have another, so we could either have this call the scheduler directly every time there's a new task. So you like have, uh, you submit a job, you talk over here, here's the metadata, uploaded the file. Okay, it's done uploading, go ahead and call the scheduler. But what if there's not a machine available yet? And so you've called it and you're like, hey, um, I got a task ready. And then you don't even have it. It, it doesn't even have an, a machine that's free to run it. Um, so then what would you keep doing retries? I think that would be a bad idea. Um, so you could do a broker. You could have this doing polling of um, this data store. You could still have this polling, this endpoint, but then you're doing polling. And so you can do something a little bit better than polling. So you can just do a broker. And so then whenever um, this one knows that there's a machine freed up, you can have this go ahead and call the scheduler. You can have this one invoke it. You're gonna have some kind of, we'll say that the scheduler has some kind of endpoint for invoking it whenever there's a machine that's freed up um, that can take a job. And so once um, this thing's invoked, like, hey, a machine just became available, it can pull off of this broker and put it onto the uh, workers. And so this will just be a queue of um, some tasks. It's just a, it's just another Kafka stream of um, tasks that need run. And so we will have um, the message format is just going to be a task ID. We'll just have a task ID 2345. Okay, and then I think traditionally you have the person that is producing messages for the broker is gonna own the broker itself. And so it'll be within the team space itself. And then um, so the full flow over here, uh, you've got a job you wanna submit, call this, put the metadata in here. Um, this one gets a pre-signed URL all the way from over there. Uh, passes over the pre-signed URL, this uploads it to that URL. Uh, and then when you're done, you say, hey, I'm done uploading it. And then this thing puts a message onto this broker right here. And then uh, when a machine gets freed up, this thing pulls a task ID off of that broker right there. Uh, yeah, and um, then this thing is going to be producing messages that are gonna get stuck on this. And so it is going to own the, um, broker, this, this team is going to own that broker, have this, and the broker is going to go in there. But the task runners themselves are going to be owned by this team. Um, that's my experience from what I've seen in production services for how um, ownership works across teams for um, message brokers and the thing that pulls off for them. Um, okay, and then the input and output store themselves, I felt those should probably be owned by the task service since this thing is just owning things in a more uh, longer retention period. This one is dealing with um, a more long-term retention period for the tasks where it's beyond just the scheduling and on the machine itself. Well, this one only cares about uh, tasks for the lifetime that they are actually on the workers. That is the full span for which it cares about the tasks. So I thought that would make more sense for the input and output object store to actually be owned by this team then. And we're gonna move this over here and curve it like that. And then it, we do end up having data stores that are shared um, across teams. It's the object store is the only um, case of that. Uh, you can't really get around with that. And I have seen object stores shared across multiple teams before in production. It's just, you don't do it with um, DBs like this one or this one. Um, we can go ahead and talk about the schema of these data stores. Any questions before I keep going with this though?
Okay, we can go ahead and talk about the schema on these then. Um, so we're going to have the task DB, um, which we'll have over here. And we're also going to have a machine DB. So machine DB is this one, and the task DB is this one. Uh, we are going to have at least a task ID. I have a task ID, something like two, three, four, five. There'll be a task status. It'll be, uh, you'll have received, you'll have um, in progress, and it's actually running. You'll have completed or failed. So you can also have failed. Um, okay, so there's received. I think there can be a scheduled status. Okay, I see a comment in the chat. Currently, the scheduler seems to be single point of failure. What can we do to ensure the availability of the system when the scheduler goes down? Um, also, failed tasks. So when the scheduler is down, uh, that means that I will not be able to take more tasks off the queue. So uh, the broker actually improved the availability because if we didn't have the broker there, um, the task service would have to call the scheduler possibly directly to hand off the new tasks. Um, but instead, we have, uh, we're going to use Kafka here because it's around 10,000 um, messages per second. So we have this. And so then um, this service only cares about putting the message onto the queue. Um, and then it would be able to hand off the scheduler. Um, and so when it's down, it will not be able to pull off new tasks. Um, and uh, I don't think anything else is really calling it. This one is um, making the calls to the task info point. It is making requests to that. So when it's down, that does not mean that anything else goes down. The only thing that would be down is um, tasks getting um, scheduled. Uh, oh, okay. So you could have received and then you have um, scheduled. And so when the scheduler is down, what you're going to see is a whole bunch of tasks that are sitting in the received status and they're not moving to scheduled. And you could have the scheduler talk to, um, I guess you could also have a task update endpoint. Um, you would need something that would need to update the task status. Uh, it originally go into as received. And then when it makes it the scheduler, the scheduler will uh, call something that will mark it as um, scheduled. And then when it makes it to the workers, it's in progress or, um, yeah, I, I mean, you'd only have it as scheduled for like the brief period of time that it is pulled off of here and then not actually stuck on the workers yet. Um, I guess that, yeah, it seems like it's not 100% necessary so I, if you did want to om omit it, and again, when the schedule is down, you would still just see people, uh, you'd still just see tasks sitting in that received status over here and um, schedules down, it's not gonna be making it forward. Um, and then uh, when it comes online, it'll start pulling the tasks off and putting them on the machines. When they get to the machines, um, you can go ahead and have it marked as in progress. You can go ahead and have, so when this thing is doing the push to the workers, it could go ahead and have it do a call after it's finally done placing it on there to mark it as in progress. Um, or I guess you might just want to, um, you might want to have this thing properly compile the code and get it running I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure if you fully need a scheduled um, status, but I think I see it on there a lot. Um, I think I saw some other designs had that scheduled status in there, but these might be redundant. Um, the scheduler, though, uh, is a single point of failure. If you add so the message broker improves the availability, it makes it a little bit less of a, a thing that can just kill the entire system. Um, what? Uh, how do we handle failed tasks? Um, so, uh, sometimes what, what if somebody just submits code that is improperly compiled or, um, something like that? So you can have the code itself could fail. Um, you could have it, uh, the code, you could have the code itself fail, in which case it's, it's, you know, you, yeah, that's outside of the control of the system. But what if it's a system failure, like somebody 
and the um, data center trips over the cord of one of the workers, and then the heartbeats are failing. Um, so then uh, if, if the heartbeats are, are failing to go through, um, I guess you could have, um, you would you'd probably need to reassign the task to a new machine. So I guess you would maybe wanna have a, another service that's maybe monitoring this machine data store and looking at the heartbeats. And if anything is um, not giving heartbeats anymore, you would probably wanna take that task ID and stick it back onto the broker or something like that. Um, so you could have um, heartbeat watcher. And so it's just going to pull the machine data store and look at the timestamps that we're going to be putting on this. I'll get into the schema for the machine data store here in a couple minutes. And so then you would just have it doing that. Yeah. Um, I've, yeah, I was kind of hoping to gloss over that just because it, it makes this diagram a lot more cluttered. I don't think a lot of people actually, a lot of people will talk about heartbeats and they'll say like, yes, you're going to want to have a, uh, you're, you're going to want to have a, um, timestamp or something in the machine database. Let's, let's go ahead and flesh that out. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to have a machine ID, let's say one, two, three, and we'll have, um, last, uh, heartbeat, um, timestamp. Um, it's just the last uh, heartbeat to properly get emitted by one of the machines. It'll look something like 137006000. Oh, that's right. You also want to have a receipt time for the task. So that way you don't have any, if, if there's one, um, if you just don't have free machines or something, um, or you're having a task get rescheduled, I think it makes sense to record the timestamp for when you've received it. And so if you decide not to have this thing interact directly with the scheduler and you just decide to go a polling route where this thing is polling for the next task uh, every single time that um, a machine becomes available. So a machine becomes available, you want a new task. Another setup could be that this thing just pulls this thing, this service somehow to get next task, um, get next task to run. That, that's, that's another way to um, approach the problem. Uh, so receipt time, you'll have 137004000. Um, so I think that makes sense to store there. And then we have last heartbeat time. And so this will be watching this and it'll continuously be pulling for the most stale heartbeats. And so let's say that the heartbeats are um, every minute. We'll, we'll just throw some random number out there. Uh, maybe, maybe five minutes makes more sense. I, I imagine there's some kind of tuning you would be doing, but you'd look for the, the, the uh, you, you'd do a key range query against this for the most stale heartbeat time. And then if that is older than uh, this criteria, you could even set it to like half an hour, like, hey, if the machine doesn't respond for half an hour, maybe, maybe it just like failed to do a heartbeat once and then it manages to reboot itself or, or um, get back onto the network properly. Um, on its own. So you can tune how often, uh, what, what staleness criteria you're using for uh, determining whether or not a worker has uh, gotten knocked out. Um, but yeah, so you, you pull for uh, what the most stale heartbeat is. Um, okay, you'd also have an assigned task ID. You would have a task ID that is assigned to the machine. And um, Okay, you need the location of the data. So you have, you're, you're submitting your task, you get your get a task ID assigned. Um, you maybe have the user ID on there. Um, so um, it's, this is a lot, most people gloss over that, I think. Um, but you would technically probably have a user ID on there for who submitted the job and then only let them view their own jobs or something. Um, or not allow other users to screw with each other's jobs. Um, so we have that. And then um, what was I going to do? Um, oh, the location. Yeah, so um, task, uh, it's um, S3 input location. Um, and you have some kind of S3 URL. 
uh, my bucket. Uh, you'd also have an output location. I think you can go ahead and um, create both of those pre-signed URLs um, at the time of the task creation. Um, yeah, I think you can go ahead and generate both of these pre-signed URLs like right at uh, the time of um, receiving the task. Um, okay, so we have those, we have this. Um, I think you would maybe want to send, no, you could go ahead and fetch the input location when you're doing the poll for the task info. So this, that would just get sent over through the task info. We want to figure out what kind of DB we want to use. We also want to figure out the primary keys and partition keys. Um, so, um, I think you would maybe want to do something that would, uh, you would use this as a partitioning key. It's, it's going to form, this would be the primary key and the partitioning key. Um, yeah, and you would not want to, um, there's a thing with like timestamps that can cause an issue. You wanna make sure that these task IDs are getting written in a round robin fashion around the partitions. Um, I think it does that by default is that it like assigns the partition with a modulus instead of having them like the first quarter of task IDs are on one partition in the last quarters or quarter are all on one specific partition. I, I think it does already do a round robin fashion, but it's gonna be the primary key, um, the primary key uh, and the partition key. And then you don't, uh, with DynamoDB, you don't need to specify a sort key. Um, I don't know how that, it, so with Cassandra, if you went with something like that, you would have, um, it just takes the last, couple of um, bits for the sort key and the first couple of bits are the partition key, I think. Um, I'm not feeling Cassandra here though. I'm actually feeling DynoDB for the technology um, because you're gonna be updating this and Cassandra does not handle deletions very well. Um, it's probably actually gonna be a little bit read heavy. You might be checking this a whole lot. You're also going to want to check on the, is, is, you know, is it done yet? Is it done yet? It is? Okay, now I can full, pull my file out of the output object store. This thing's gonna have direct uh, access to the uh, object store, just like for the input store. It would be like, you, you don't wanna send the object through an intermediary service. That intermediary service would become bandwidth bound. Um, you'd, it's better to just have direct access uh, like that. Um, okay, uh, so um, primary key and partition key. Do you want any other keys though? Do you want to sort by anything else? This is already an enum. You don't need to sort by that. This would make for a nice secondary key for the, the polling if, you, if you're going to poll for a next task. Um, so in some cases, this, this just seems like it'd make for a nice secondary index. Um, yeah. And then for this, um, that's probably gonna be the primary key. Oh, okay, and I was also feeling um, DynamoDB. Um, if it was small, so we had a really big scale. If you had like, if this was just like Jenkins or like your everyday task runner for other companies, you'd just use PostgreSQL um, and you would maybe like it, it, at that smaller scale, you'd probably use PostgreSQL over here and you just, merge the two data stores. And then instead of having all these microservices, you just have one. But I picked, I made sure to pick a company that had a really big scale like um, Dropbox, uh, because then it's not just like, all right, we got three to five boxes on the, uh, on the diagram. I guess we're done here. Um, that wouldn't be very exciting. So DynamoDB, um, if it was smaller scale, PostgreSQL would work really just fine. Um, not Cassandra because it's not right heavy. Do you need strong consistency here? I don't think so. Um, yeah, so we're doing a write over here to the broker. It's consistent within like a, a f in under a few hundred milliseconds. Um, the broker is going to add enough latency that you don't really need to worry about that. Um, yeah, I don't think there'd really be any issues with eventual consistency on this. 
but if you if you can always set dyno db to strong consistency so dyno db would still work if you needed a stronger consistency guarantee um, over here we've got that this is going to be writing a lot but it's updating same thing and then we're doing polling every so often so i feel like this the way that we'd be updating well, okay, maybe we'd be able to do event sourcing for the heartbeats. If we did event sourcing for the heartbeats, then how would we look for stale ones? So then you'd have to look at the machine IDs one at a time and figure out what their uh, most recent heartbeat was. Um, so I think it'd be better to not do that. That would also add a lot of, um, uh, you'd have, um, so we have three IDs here. So that's three ints, that's like 12 bytes. And then um, we have, uh, we said how many machines? 100,000 machines. And then depending on the frequency, of it, uh, so you would have, if it was every minute, you'd have 100,000 seconds divided by 60, that'd be like 1,000 um, holes per day minimum. I'm trying to figure out how expensive event sourcing would be. Um, so you have uh, one, some 200K bytes, it's around 1 million bytes. That'd be 1K kilobytes, one uh, megabyte um, for every single pole, uh, like one, one um, loop of all the machines doing a pull would be one megabyte of data. And then if you're doing at least 1,000 per day, then that would be one gig of data every day. So that's not too crazy. It would not be a lot of data, but it still is like, do you really need event sourcing there? Um, and so it's, uh, if event sourcing, you would do um, Sandra um, without event sourcing. So I'm not going the event sourcing store, uh, the event sourcing approach. I'd feel DynamoDB and um, eventual consistency is probably good enough. You should set the staleness for the alive versus dead threshold to be um, high enough that you can miss at least a heartbeat or two. So eventual consistency should be good enough. And um, again, you're getting like 100,000. Oh, you, you have 100,000 poles per minute. So then that'll be 100K divided by uh, 60. And so that would be about 1,000 to 2,000 hits per second, that's uh, 1,000, 2,000 write operations. Um, so I mean, that still is a little bit on the higher end where you might wanna do um, sharding or, or something like that. Uh, yeah. So you, you, you still need to use more than one machine probably on this. And so it'd be a good idea to do DynamoDB. Um, you, you'd rather scale up a little bit proactively than be like, oh, suddenly we have this one day where we're somehow getting 10K TPS. And so our one machine can't handle it and chokes out. Um, you'd rather scale a little bit more proactively. Plus if it's only one machine, um, as in you're not doing replication, then um, you that one node getting KO'd would mean you lose all your data, which would be really bad. Um, so you should be doing replication, and then that's going to slow down the amount of writes it can handle per second a little bit more. It'll add to the write latency. And so then that decreases the number of transactions that each individual node can actually handle per second. So it's a better idea to do partitioning at that point as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I feel DynamoDB is not totally overkill. Uh, yeah, any questions here? Does, does anyone have any uh, questions before I try to find something else to deep dive? Okay, um, what else can we do? 
So I already mentioned that we can merge all these into a CRUD service. That's why I kind of have this set up like this. Um, can't really do that as much over here because these are worker machines and this is just a service. Uh, this would make sense as a CRUD. This is really low operation. This is only going to run like once a minute or something, and it's just going to do a single key range query. So that's, it's not, it's not even a full service. It's just a Lambda function or a, uh, so you can, you can set up AWS Lambda to um, be triggered by a uh, time, just like a cron job. And so that's what I envision for this thing. Um, I think I already brought up that both of these are going to be Kafka. Um, yeah, I think we already handled everything pretty nicely. Oh, uh, these are two terabytes. Oh, I can count the number of hard disks. I can I can ballpark how many hard disks we're going to need. Yeah, that could be fun. Okay, uh, we got 10 petabytes in total for the storage, uh, and it's going to be five petabytes for the input and five petabytes for the output. So each of those is going to be five petabytes. How many disks do we need? Let's say that we have 100 terabytes per HDD. Um, and so we have, uh, we need 5,000 terabytes of data. So it would be around 50 hard disks each. If we do uh, some kind of replication factor, you're probably gonna need more. So more in the neighborhood of, um, if it's just 2X, then you'd need 100. If it's three copies of the data, it would be 150. Um, I think sometimes they do stuff like erasure coding. I don't know how that actually works, but it'd probably bring down that factor of replication a fair amount. Um, but you're going to need a lot of hard disks. Um, okay, so that's that's another estimate. Um, we estimated this. I think I'm pretty happy with this. Um, I think we can wrap it up now. Are there any other are are there any questions from anybody before I wrap it up? All right, I'll let you guys go. Thanks for joining. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks again.